Good morning, good morning, good morning, uh, friends, good morning, colleagues, good morning, everybody. We greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What an honor for me to be with you today. Uh, I was last, uh, I think, was it last year or the year before last? Now, I don't know why you guys always call old people <laughs> to come and share with you uh, during the month of June, but I guess it's all about us empowering one another. I know that you had um, some young uh, people uh, speaking like Hansan and others I've seen in the whole month of uh, June, but thank you so much that you have also then chosen to, to include us just to come and share some thoughts with you. Now your subject of peace under pressure is probably one of the most important subjects, not only for young people, but for all of us. We all go through pressure in our lives, and yet God expects us uh, to have peace in all of this. Now, the question is, how does it work? Well, the scripture that you have chosen of the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 6 to 7, which you must have been reading almost every Sunday of this month of June, and perhaps even in your own private spaces, where it says in the New King James Version, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, and a key phrase there is with. So there is a praying and a supplicating, but those two things must happen with thanksgiving because that is a posture of gratitude. That is a posture of thankfulness and an attitude of gratitude will always turn your tragedy into a strategy for progress. And that is very fundamental. It is not saying we must give thanks, but it actually says with thanksgiving, which means that the, we should be praying and offering supplications. But whilst we do that, we must do that with thanksgiving. So I just wanted to highlight that before we proceed. Let your request be known to God. When you make your request be known to God, you need to do that whilst giving thanks. And then verse 7 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I'm sure you have gone through this scripture so many times, and you have tried to dissect it in many ways. Allow me today to just add a little bit of perspective in dealing with this particular scripture uh, for this month of June. If you see on the, on the screen there, you see two extremes. The first is panic or anxiety or worry. And then the second one is peace or calm or serenity. Now, these are the extremes where many of us find ourselves. So people are either anxious or they are calm. They are either panicking or they are full of peace. And it looks like there are people who, it's almost like their default position is their second nature to be calm and to be peaceful. Whilst others, they are always neurotic, anxious, and panicking all the time. So you may be asking the question, why is it so? The scripture that we have read in the first verse, it talks about anxiety. In the second verse, it talks about peace. And these are the extremes. This is a spectrum, and we must find ourselves on the side of peace all the time. Even when you are under pressure, even when there are things that are supposed to give you anxiety, the Bible says we need to make sure that we are anxious for nothing, but instead the peace of God must overwhelm us. 
How does that happen? Watch this. The, this situation of either being anxious or being calm, guess what? It's a result of one word, perception. Perception. The word perception, it means the way you look at life. The word perception, it means the attitude you have about something. So in our lives, we are going to experience pressure. Whether it's pressure to get married, whether it's pressure to pass your exam, whether it is pressure as a young person because your family is, is, is child-headed, is headed by you, and you've got pressure to support your parents whether it is pressure from social media, whether it is pressure from your peers, whether the people who are of your age are married and you are not married yet, you've got pressure. Maybe the people of your age are already earning and you are not earning and you've got pressure. Whatever kind of pressure it is, it could even be pressure in your business. It could be pressure in your health. It could be pressure of COVID-19 pandemic proportions. It could be an earthquake. It could be anything. Your perception of the pressure will determine whether you will be full of anxiety or full of peace. If your perception is negative, you will always be anxious. If your perception is positive, you will always be calm. Now, this is a very important secret that I would like you to get before we go on and I will show you how it works. But watch this, all of us do have pressure, all of us do experience pressure. How we perceive the pressure, how we interpret the pressure, determines whether we will live a life of anxiety or we will live a life of calm and peace. Now, I have said that perception means the way you look at things, the attitude you have about something. But I want to suggest to you that the simpler and the best way of looking at what perception is, is the following. The meaning you attach to an event. Please write that down. Perception is the meaning you attach to something. The meaning you attach to an event. So if you fail an examination, the meaning you attach to that failure. When there is COVID-19 pandemic and the president says, thou shall stay at home for the next three, hours, uh, three weeks, you are not getting out of your house. The meaning you attach to that event, that is called perception. If you attach a negative meaning to an event, it will cause you anxiety, panic, and harm. But if you attach a positive meaning to an event that is happening to you, it will give you peace and calm. You have heard it said that it's not really what happens to you that matters, but rather how you respond to what happens to you. But how you respond to what happens to you is informed or shaped by the meaning you attach to what happens to you. It is informed by the perception you have of what has happened to you. Here is a good example. Last year, as you know, when the coronavirus pandemic started, the president one day said, you shall not get out of your house. It messed me up. That was pressure. 
because I knew that because I earn a living through talking to groups of people, that was basically the end of my earning, at least for that period. Uh, the, 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 the workshops that were to be done the following week, they needed to be canceled. And when a workshop is canceled, it means the invoice is canceled. And if the invoice is canceled, it means the income is canceled. Now, that was real pressure for me. The first day, it made me so mad. The second day, it frustrated me big time. On the third day, I decided to say, you know what? Let me practice what I teach to people. And I teach people that it's not what happens to you that really matters, but it is how you respond to it. And I have been teaching people about learning to attach a positive meaning to a negative event. Yes, the lockdown was a negative event, but I decided on the third day, I'm going to practice what I preach. And guess what I did? I said, thank God, I've been wanting to go on a sabbatical leave to go and write my 11th book. And here is a precedent and a lockdown. They have given me a sabbatical leave where I don't even have to pay money to travel, I'll be in the comfort of my home, and I am going to write a book. And guess what? The book was written. I'm not sure whether I've got this book here. And the book was written, uh, 320 pages of a book called The Reset Blueprint, How to Survive a Crisis and thrive in the new normal. This book is found in bookshops across the country. And by the way, what I'm sharing with you today is an extract from the book. Can you believe it? If lockdown didn't happen, I wouldn't be having this book. I've got this book because I, I touched a positive meaning to something that was pressure something that was negative. Now, that does not mean that the thing ceased to be a negative thing. The truth is the workshops actually did get canceled. The truth is the invoices were never sent. The truth is I never made an income from those workshops that were supposed to take place. But what is interesting is that because I attached a positive meaning to the pressure, a positive meaning to this negative event, it placed me in a place of calm, in a place of peace, where I could be productive, where I could be fruitful, to the point of producing a book, which is now selling like cakes all over. 300 copies have been sent even to Swaziland <clears throat> during this pandemic to only one client, Central Bank of Eswatini. They have ordered these books. I'm just making an example of so many books getting out of the country to one client. I'm not even talking about uh, customers within South Africa, but the book was produced because I attached a positive meaning to pressure. I don't know what pressure you are going through. You might have lost your loved one. And I'm not undermining the magnitude of the pain that we go through. But you see, even though there is pain, if you attach a positive meaning to that event that caused you pain, there are things you are going to benefit. So we can be exposed to the same pressure, but because we attach different meanings to the same pressure, we are going to have different experiences. And you need to be very specific about the meaning that you attach. In my case, I said, thank God I have a sabbatical leave to write a book, and the book was produced. Be very careful about the meaning that you attach. 
Raymond Ackerman, for example, when he was retrenched from his job, he said, thank God I am free. And he started selling tomatoes, cabbages, and to cut the long story short, it finally became pick and pay, which is now not only in South Africa, but it is across the continent. But it's because Raymond Ackerman, when he got retrenched, he attached a positive meaning to the retrenchment, and he said, thank God, I am now free to do what I want to do, not depend on an employer as to what time I must wake up, what I must do, et cetera, et cetera. Have a specific meaning that you attach to whatever is happening in your life. But in general terms, it's either a negative meaning or a positive meaning. Now, here's a statement I would like to share with you before I show you how you can practically then do these things. Here's an insight, and this is found from my book, The Reset Blueprint, which, by the way, is found at Coombs Bookshop and Exclusive Books. Listen to this, and you can take a snapshot of this, because I really would like you to remember this. If we see pressure as an instrument or a demon for our destruction, we mourn and emerge bitter. But if we see the same pressure as an instrument or an angel for our instruction, we learn and emerge better. I really would like you to grasp this because this is so crucial. The choice is yours. And the choice is not in whether there will be pressure or not. The choice is not whether there will be negative events or not. You can choose whether there will be COVID-19 pandemic or not, whether the rain will be weak or not, whether we'll get into a technical recession or not. You can choose that. But you can choose how you see the things that happen in your life. This statement says to you, if you choose to see negative events, to see pressures in your life as an instrument or demon for your destruction, you will spend your time mourning and later on you emerge being a very bitter person. And when you are bitter, you get beaten by life because you are not in a place of strength. You are in a place of weakness because you, are, you have now become a victim. But if you see pressure as an instrument, as an angel for your instruction to give you feedback, to teach you, to train you, you learn from that pressure and emerge better. And really the choice is yours. Now this, which I've just said now, it is called perception management. It is called perception management. In other words, you need to manage your perceptions. In fact, let me really say that all of your life, your biggest job on earth, believe it or not, is managing perception. <laughs> Manage the way you see things. Manage the way you see the things that happen in your life. And these things are happening every day, good and bad. And by the way, even mismanaging how you see a good thing can mess you up. So everything that happens to you, you must manage how you are seeing that. And I'm going to share with you 
three things that you need to do when you are to manage your perception. In other words, there are three things that are at play. There are four, or rather three factors that are at play when it comes to the way you see things. If these things are not well coordinated and managed, you may actually crowd your perception and not see clearly. And your wrong perception will make you to react or respond wrongly. The first thing is the power of faith. And I would like you to embrace the power of faith. I know that you are Christians and the Bible says the just shall live by faith. But when we go through pressure, sometimes we forget to take advantage of this important thing that the Lord has given us, which is called faith. You know that faith really is the eyes of our spirit. Please take that. Faith really is the eyes of our spirit. And that is why verse 7 says, the peace of God that passes all human understanding. The peace of God that surpasses all human understanding. Human understanding. Meaning that the way we examine and analyze pressure and the events that happen to our lives, we must not depend on our human understanding. In other words, you do not analyze the pressure that is happening to you using your naked eyes. Do not use the eyes of the flesh. Do not use the five senses of taste and sight and smell, etc. But use the eyes of the spirit. <laughs> that is what faith is about. In fact, that is why you know that uh, in the book of Hebrews 11, 1, the Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The evidence, but how can you have evidence when the things are not seen? It means you have seen them, but you have seen them with the eyes of your spirit, with the eyes of your understanding. So faith is the evidence of things that your naked eyes have not seen, but your eyes of the spirit have seen them. In other words, through faith, you have a way of going to the promised land and spy the promised land and see the milk, the honey, and the grape, and then come back to a point where your physical eyes can no longer see the milk, the honey, and the grapes but you have visited that place through the eyes of your spirit. And you come back and say, let my people go. Or you come back and say, let me go because I've seen a place that is better than where I am now. You have used the eyes of your spirit, which is called faith. Now that's a very critical aspect that you need to be using as a child of God if you are to gravitate towards the peace side of the spectrum. Now, here is a practical example of what King David did when he was under pressure. He had serious pressure of running away from King Saul. King Saul wanted to kill him for the anointing that was on him. That was serious pressure. And David says, I had fainted. Now, that's the old English, but it actually should be in the new English. I would have fainted. But in the old English, it would it read, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I would have fainted. I would have crushed. I would have died. I would have lost heart. I would have collapsed if I did not believe 
to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is a very critical thing. What this means is, you know, you need to understand the words that the land of the living, it means in the physical realm. So King David says, I would have fainted. The only thing that stopped me from fainting, collapsing, and dying is because I believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, in the physical realm, which means he had seen the goodness of the Lord in the spirit, but it was not yet in the physical realm, but he had seen it in the spirit. And he then believed that he will finally see the same thing he has seen in the spirit. He will finally see it in the land of the living. The phrase land of the living, it means in the physical realm here on earth under the sun. Now the eyes of faith have shown you stuff based on the promises that the Lord has made to you. Allow the eyes of the spirit to see the promises of the Lord, that he will never leave you nor forsake you, that he will be with you in, in under pressure and everywhere else. But that must take you a step further. Believe that that which you have seen in the spirit, you will also see in the land of the living. I wish you could understand this because this is a life transforming truth. David says, I would have died, collapsed, gone, committed suicide. The only thing that stopped me from doing that is because I believed that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The just shall live by faith. The second thing, because my time is, is gone now, I'm left with three minutes. The second factor is fear. Yeah, boo. The second factor is fear. Now, once you embrace the power of faith, you must now be aware, be aware of the peril of fear. There is power of faith, but there is the peril, the, the danger, the curse of fear. Job, who has gone through, <coughs> excuse me, much pressure, and you know the story of Job. If you think you have been under pressure, well, you really have not been under pressure like Job has been. Job, in that pressure, he makes a statement that opens our eyes. How, in fact, he made the pressure to be worse before he got a revelation later. He was in a state of panic, a state of anxiety. He was not even enjoying his nights because he always thought that his children are in trouble. He, he really made the situation worse. And how did he make it? He tells us now, now that he has learned the lesson, he says, for the thing I greatly feared has come upon me. And what I dreaded, the way to dread, it means to avoid. And what I dreaded has happened to me. This is so serious, Bazalwan. When you are afraid of a thing, you actually attract it, believe it or not. Whatever you are afraid of, you are busy attracting it to your life. So don't allow yourself to be consumed by fear. Fear will paralyze you. Fear will make the things you're afraid of to become real in your life. Avoidance, the word dread that to avoid, he says, what I avoided has happened to me. We were not designed to avoid trouble. We are not supposed to avoid poverty but we are supposed to pursue prosperity. So we are people in pursuit, not in avoidance of something, but in pursuit of something. Don't avoid the negative, but pursue the positive. Why? When you avoid a thing, you use emotional energy. 
And the same energy you are using to avoid or to resist the thing is the same energy you need to pursue something. So when you keep on avoiding, 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 you get tired and tired and tired and you are so exhausted, you can't do what you are supposed to do. Don't spend your life avoiding, but spend your life pursuing. If you avoid making mistakes, guess what? You actually make them. If those of you are driving, when you are driving in your small car on a highway and there's a truck on the side, wisdom teaches us that don't focus too much on the truck, trying to avoid the truck. Because the more you try to avoid it, you actually get closer to it. Just focus on your lane and pursue your journey of success. I'm so sorry that our time is up. I need to leave uh, to stop right here. Uh, but then the last one, which maybe I will not explain a lot because of time, is the principle of few or the principle of one. This one you honor. So remember, you embrace the power of faith. You, you beware the peril of fear and you honor. Honor the principle of few or the principle of one. We don't have time to explain this, but you know the story of Martha and Mary and Jesus in the mix. One day, Jesus being tired from preaching, casting out demons, he gets into his sister's home. Martha welcomes Jesus with a lot of activity, going to the kitchen to cook and prepare a meal. And the sister of Martha, which is Mary, decided to sit at the feet of Jesus. And guess what happened? Whilst Martha was running around doing a good thing, by the way, which is to serve, which is to serve, running around, he became worried. And he said to Jesus, Jesus, look at Mary. She's just sitting there doing nothing. She's not helping me at all. I'm doing the cooking alone and serving, etc., etc. Now, Jesus Christ answered with a statement that has opened our eyes to the principle of few or the principle of one. He said, Martha, 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 you are anxious. You are worried. You are concerned and upset about many things, but few things are needed in this world. Or indeed, only one thing is needed. And guess what, Martha? Your sister Mary has chosen what's better. Listen to me. We are often worried about many things, and yet there are a few things that matter. If you can train yourself to always focus on what really matters, very few things on earth will worry you. It's three minutes past 11. I need to stop right here because we must respect time. Um, so may God bless you. I hope you have learned something and so sorry to stop so abruptly. I got taken into this um, uh, 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 work. Please take a picture of this and go and revise this over and over again. I promise you, your life will never be the same. But just to summarize everything, all of us, we do go through pressure of different kinds. Young and old, we go through pressure as to whether you will live a life of anxiety and panic or a life of peace and calm, it depends on the meaning you attach to the pressure that is happening to you. Always learn to attach a positive meaning to every kind of pressure. If you do that, you will be peaceful. And if you are peaceful, you will be a peacemaker. And if you are a peacemaker, you are indeed a child of God. And of course, make sure that you take care of the three factors that I play with regards to our perception. Taking uh, advantage of the power of faith can really clear your perception and making sure that fear does not overwhelm you because it will attract the very things you do not like and then making sure that you declutter your life 
and remain just with a few things that matters. May God bless you. May God uh, give you peace under pressure. Thank you so much.